Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to another podcast. In this episode, I'm going to be chatting to the Atlantic Salmon Trust. They are undertaking a project in the Moray Firth, trying to tag and then acoustically track salmon smolts. They're attempting to uncover the reasons why Atlantic salmon are disappearing from our rivers. Each year, our wild Atlantic salmon begin one of the planet's greatest natural migrations from streams just like this. An annual journey that they have embarked on for more than 60 million years. Wild salmon return to the river that they were born in to spawn. Travelling thousands of miles, their heroic journey will see them famously leap against river currents and obstacles to reach the calmer, sheltered rivers and streams they need to lay and fertilise their eggs. While our rivers were once teeming with the iconic Atlantic salmon, these incredibly determined fish have been failing to return, and in immense numbers. We know they begin their journey, we just don't know what happens on the way to the ocean, or if they manage to make it out of the rivers at all. Somewhere on their journey, wild salmon numbers are being decimated. For every 100 salmon that leave Scotland's rivers for the sea, less than 5 return, a decline of nearly 70% in just 25 years. The warning is stark. I caught up with Atlantic Salmon Trust's CEO, Mark Billsby, over Skype to find out more. I think it'd be nice to start for the people that are listening about what the Atlantic Salmon Trust is and what it does and what its aims are. Okay. Um, Well, the Atlantic Salmon Trust is a conservation charity that focuses on the lives of salmon and sea trout. Um, We cover the whole of the United Kingdom. And we've got a really simple aim um, to provide better evidence to lead to better management for salmon and sea trout so we can turn around their decline. Uh, we want to see the, we want to stop the decline of salmon and sea trout. It's very simple. We're going to be want to discuss some of the reasons about the decline of Atlantic salmon. Um, yep. But most of our listeners tend to be, uh, there, there are quite a few salmon anglers, but quite a few of them are, are trout and grayling anglers. So okay. I think it might be nice to describe a little bit about the life cycle of a salmon um, so they can get an understanding and appreciation of, of how it's different to trout and grayling. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, irrespective of, the, of when a salmon comes into uh, a river, they typically uh, spawn in autumn, um, slightly earlier in the north and uh, later in the south. It's all very um, weather uh, temperature dependent. And the eggs get laid in the gravel, laid down in gravel for the winter months and surviving spates, ice, snow, whatever, uh, and then hatch in the early spring. Um, They will then spend their first year as fry living in the rivers, and uh, after that they're called par. And overall they spend between one and four years in freshwater before undergoing the transformation to become smolt in preparation from going from freshwater to sea. Okay. Um, And it's normally in the spring that they head out to sea. Um, we only know bits of their life cycle at sea. Right. Um, but we do know that they head up to the, the Norwegian Sea uh, and they're using the currents that go past the UK as both, as we, th- we think, as a way of transport, but also as a way of providing them food. Um, they head up to the Norwegian Sea on that. Uh, and then some of them head over as further afield as Greenland before heading back. You know, so right across the North Atlantic. Um, and they may spend a winter at sea when they come back as grills. So when we're talking about grills, it's fish that spent one winter at sea. Okay, yeah. When we're talking about salmon, it's one that spent two or three years uh, okay. at sea and will have gone further afield. Okay. Um, so there's obviously, um, they've adapted to, to, to be able to survive in fresh water yep. for spawning and and salt water for essentially feeding. Is Is that... Is that right? Is that the way you kind of look at it? Yeah, well, they spent the first, first wee while in, in fresh water. So they will, um, feed, they will, will, will they feed as par, uh, obviously, to grow on in, in fresh water? Yeah, yeah. So, um, that, you know, they're living off uh, the insect life, the fly life um, that's falling in or being produced in the streams. Um, and they'll grow from, you know, fries less than your small finger. Um, up yeah. to about five or six inches before heading out to sea, so actively growing. Okay. And there's not many nutrients in these rivers, so yeah. on the whole, so it can be quite slow growth rate. And then their growth rate takes off when they go to sea, and they go from being um, 
six inches long, uh, up to the size of full-grown salmon uh, in a year or two. Of course. And obviously that transition then from fresh water to salt water, uh, is there any kind of scientific explanation of how that occurs does it occur quickly or is it is it gradually moving through the brackish water that there's a slow change how how does that change occur how, how do they adapt i'm not a fish biologist no <laughs> <laughs> but what they do is when they when they get down towards the salt water they are they are fully transformed and ready ready okay. to be in salt water okay it's a huge undertaking going from um being a freshwater fish to a saltwater fish, that's a huge physiological change. Um, but by the time they get to the sea, they're ready to go. Sure. So, you know. Okay. And I think that when I'm speaking to, to salmon, uh, sorry, speaking to salmon, I wish I could, speaking to um, anglers, uh, members of the public about salmon, I think the thing uh, about Atlantic salmon that everyone kind of knows is that they they seem to make it back to the rivers that they were spawned in or even sometimes the very little kind of headland streams the very patches of gravel that, that, that may have been spawned in so is there any understanding of, of how salmon undertake that navigation and how they manage to find the way back to the waters that they potentially were spawned in i, I think people are learning about this all the time and getting the nuance of it, nuances of it o- over time yeah um, but the, the smolts are pretty much learning their rivers as they descend and they're imprinting what the smell is, what the okay. local underwater landmarks are. So and so they can they can recognise their river and as they move further out so they can recognise their surrounds. Um, and then navigate. They navigate out and navigate back. I mean it is it is it is uh, an absolute wonder really. Um, yeah, it is. you know, of, of how they manage to do that. Um there is a decline in the numbers of Atlantic salmon effectively running our rivers, yeah. um, um, which I'm very aware of. And, and most anglers that fish for salmon or have fish for salmon are aware of. But it, it's, it's an awareness that, I, that is totally, I think, misunderstood by the general public. Just briefly... What countries are affected by this decline in a, in Atlantic salmon? It's across the whole of the North Atlantic. Okay. Um, you know, from Canada to Iceland to Norway. You know, over the last 30 to 40 years, the number of salmon that were actively feeding at sea has dropped from around 8 to 10 million down to about 3 to 5 million. And there's no sign of that decline halting. You know, some rivers doing okay, some rivers not doing so well. But overall, um, that trend has been for dropped from eight to ten million down to three to five. Yeah, and and as you said, this is this isn't just an issue for Scotland. Then this is a, a UK wide and a European wide problem, and North Atlantic wide as North well, Atlantic. right across right across the ocean. Okay. the The Atlantic Salmon Trust is undertaking a um, a project called the Missing Salmon Project. Could you describe on what you're trying to achieve with it? The aim, the really simple aim, is to stop the decline of salmon. Um, and it's a way to try and involve it, to reverse it. And it's, it's got two parts. First is a likely suspects framework. And that's a technique to bring together all the information on fish stocks and salmon stocks and work out where the losses are occurring and what's responsible for those losses. Um, it's a really tried and tested technique um, that had been used to restore cod stocks in the Irish Sea. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's got a proven track record, and it really is a way to work out what the problems are. And then once you've worked out what the problems are and the different size of those problems, you're a long way along the way to being at working out solutions to them. And everyone goes, problems are all at sea. Well, the problems were all at sea for the Irish cod stocks, yet they've managed to turn those around. So that's that's what we're looking to. The second is is a major salmon tracking project in the Moray Firth. Um, and we're using the Moray Firth because it has about the rivers flowing into the Moray Firth uh, in the northeast of Scotland has about 20% of the UK stock of wild salmon. And our aim is to track the salmon smolts down the rivers and out to sea for the first hundred kilometres. Uh, it's a really ambitious project, and no one's been able to track them that far in the UK as yet. Um, 
we've only been able to get this off the ground. We're in the process of getting it off the ground at the moment because we brought together many enthusiastic and willing partners. And without their support, we could never attempt to achieve this. Actually, on the ground, we're talking about physically tagging and tracking salmon. Is that right? Yeah, we're going to be tagging them with an acoustic tag that gives off a, a coded ping. Um, now these pings are picked up by receivers in the river. Okay. Um, and um, as they go past, you know, they hear the fish going past. Ah, and right. three large arrays at sea where you've got receivers in sort of curtains across sections of the bays. Um, and, and we just call them arrays. Um, and the aim is to help us identify where the fish are going missing. You know, how many are we losing in, in, in the rivers before they even get it to sea? You know, some work on the Abedinshire D and the Devron. Um, many of the smolts don't actually make it to sea. Right. So we need so we need to find out where they go missing and working with the local fishery boards and trusts and also the likes of Marine Scotland Science, what's happening to these fish? And if you find out how many are going and what's happening to them, you're a long way, a long way to being able to try and do something about it. The the way that anglers, um, uh, if you ever go on to Facebook or that you know you read some of the, the the forums, put it politely, that anglers tend to be quite live and direct about what they think. <laughs> I've noticed that <laughs> what they think about the salmon fishing, the decline of salmon, and the reasons why, and 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 fair enough that the anglers want to, to see action. They seem to have many theories from predation to overfishing at sea, lack of yep. food or, or the movement of food, rising sea temperatures. Fish farming is another big culprit that's blamed. I, I see many people talking about predation and particularly predation from seals and birds that seem to have arrived in numbers. The allegation is that the, the seals and birds are taking smolts or well, certainly the birds taking smolts before they manage to get to sea. Um, is there any evidence on the ground for that? And, and if there is, is there any? Is it a major issue potentially? And more importantly, it, is there a will or an ability to actually deal with it? I think I think there's, there's, there's a whole host of questions in there, <laughs> but, um, and I, I try and answer them as best I can. But the um, this is where I think the likely suspect framework is yes. its key, because it works out the relative scale of each of these problems. So um, if you have um, a cormorant eating a fish, the relevant people can apply for a license and deal with it. Yeah. If you've got something else eating a fish, which is perhaps much more protected, no one's going to apply for a license to deal with it. So if you're watching a dolphin eat salmon, which they do. Of course. So what we need to do is get the likely suspects framework um, to work out the scale of each prob each of these problems. And then we need, this provides us with the hard facts. We can take these hard facts as evidence to the powers that be yeah. and have a sensible conversation, about, a sensible conversation with them about what needs to be done because there'll be some issues that you can do something about and there'll be other issues that we can't do anything about. And it's getting all, all of their relative scales um, into context. And you know, predation is an issue. Um, but I, I was seeing some uh, some tracking work that was done uh, in Aberdeenshire. And, um, you know, we'd been, we'd been worried about seal predation and uh, bird predation. And uh, um gentleman who's doing the, the work and said, we also caught a ten pound bass right. from out of the river. <laughs> now you see, you see the seals, you see the birds, but you also need to keep an open mind because there can be things happening below the surface of the water that you can't see, and that's where you really need to be able to um, use the like the suspects framework to um, tease out the the really important strands of information. And I guess I guess you've got to consider things, especially with with predation, if, if you are seeing an increase in things like cormorants, I guess you've got to kind of try and consider why. Um, if you're getting big influxes of these predators that aren't normally there, and why are they there? And is it because that their natural food, yeah. maybe further out at sea, has moved or is no longer there? Oh, absolutely. You need to, you need um, it's it, it you need to have 
a good understanding of the whole ecology of fish and what's what's impacting upon them, and also you know like you say what's impacting on some of the predators as well. Yeah, if I mean, you look at things in isolation, it, that's where we we've kind of made mistakes in the past. And of course, this you know the the the, the salmon food chain is you know the salmon runs all the way up the the food chain, and 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 creatures like seals you know are going to are going to eat it and that's you know they're entitled to their meal that's, that, that's one of the key bits about that they're, they're they're the canary in the mine mm. for our rivers and for our seas because if 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 we lose them it's not a good sign about what's happening either in our rivers or at sea yeah um so that they really are one of these iconic species that we need to look after as i as i kind of touched on um earlier when when we speak to anglers and those that work on the rivers, we're very aware of the decline of Atlantic salmon. Yep. But the general public, from my limited experience in talking to them, probably not so much. And they often, I think, confuse farmed salmon that they see on the fishmonger's slab in Tesco's or other supermarkets are available with... Um, with wild salmon, they they don't even quite understand the difference between the two a lot of the time. What has been the response of the media so far to campaigns such as yours? It's it's to be perfectly honest, it's been mixed. Um, for those, there's, there's different forms of media, and there's those who are doing like we are now, where they can we actually have a conversation or we take them out and um, show them what we're doing on the ground. You get them out and show the tracking programs or. Mm. Uh, what, what's being done to look after the fish and, and we find on the whole that these people are really supportive um we the key is for us we have a duty to get out there and tell people about the plight of salmon and we need to do more and more of that mm. and um it, it, it's going to be the key because if, if we don't all work together to look after the salmon i'm afraid there's a real risk that we're going to lose them in the future uh you know they, they do cope with change but it's the rate of change that can be really difficult for them. Yeah. Um, just wanted to touch on, if I may, another likely suspect, as you called it, of the decline of salmon, yeah. which is fish farming. Um, and that's the intensive aquaculture of farm salmon, effectively, that we're talking about in Scotland. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe that's mainly on the West Coast. Is, is that right? It is, yeah. And yeah. also on the um, uh, Orkney and Chatham Isles as well. Okay. The the Salmon and Trout Association, I think they've changed their name now, um, but they ran a campaign, I think it was geared up towards Christmas last year, that instead of just, you know, putting out the usual message of salmon's declining and, and you know, we need to do something, etc., yeah. they really went after the, some of the supermarkets um, that were selling farmed salmon because they'd managed to get hold of some data and i think it was about uh sea lice numbers and some farms having a higher than the recommended number of sea lice etc and for me anyway that really seemed to achieve a little bit of cut through with people because they were targeting what is effectively a food product to the end do you think there's any kind of merit in going down those lines um, is that an approach that's worth building on? Yeah, I think so. It's one um, that the AST has been very supportive of. Um, we have a policy of encouraging the agriculture industry to adopt a new code of practice called the Aqua, Aquaculture Stewardship Council. Yeah. Um, which, if you take uh, a supermarket, quite often if you go and buy some fish, some sea fish from um uh, any of the supermarkets, it might have room stewardship council on it, and that's to show that the fish has been uh, sustainably sourced. Yeah. Um, so, an example of the Irish, uh, the, the cod from the Irish Sea, they're now sustainably sourced. Um, and uh, we're asking them to go for this, aqua, the equivalent, which is the Aquaculture Stewardship Council code of practice. Okay. Um, so there's, you know, the, there's a stamp there that's not more. You know, it's got it has to make sure that there is good husbandry of these fish. Sure, sea lice are a real issue, and so, um, they're a real issue for fish farmers. They don't want them, and they're, they certainly are a real issue um, for wild fish. So, could you uh, we, could you for the for our listeners just explain 
why intensive farmed salmon is bad for wild salmon? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's really simple in terms of the it's shared space. Okay. So um, at the moment, the salmon cages are out at sea, and they're nets. So the, um, the fish are contained within a, a large net, uh, and it's a scale of it. You know, they're uh, a little bit out of date now. It's a couple of thousand tons. It, up to a couple of thousand tons of fish in in a, on a site, and um, the cages are porous in terms of they let water in and out, and also sea lice in and out. So the sea lice that are on the wild fish will then get transferred onto the farm fish, and because there's so many farmed fish on a on a site, um, the, those numbers of lice can build up and then reinfect the wild fish at a much higher level. Okay, so, so it's so, just the differences in scales. When I, I talked about the um, eight to ten million salmon mm. uh, going down to three to five million salmon, the number of wild salmon compared to agriculture salmon now is is a very small percentage. I can't remember the figure off the top of my head. But it's uh, the agriculture is much much bigger um, than the wild salmon industry. Really. So literally, these wild fish are having to swim past or swim in these waters where these intensive salmon are being farmed, and they, they, they're literally just picking up lice picking or lice. disease as they go past. Yeah, it's the equivalent of um, ticks or fleas. Okay. And just enough of them um, cause serious damage to the fish. Uh, um, just moving on then a little bit, what's been the um, the response from either the UK or the, the Scottish government to the decline in Atlantic salmon? If well, I've got more experience with the Scottish experience. Okay. And I think over the, over the last few years, um, there's been much greater recognition of it. Um, so there's been a number of things going on. And, um, for example, about three years ago, they, they, they placed a moratorium on coastal mixed up netting which was an indiscriminate way of taking fish from multiple rivers, which may or may not um, be at their conservation limits and thresholds. They need to be able to sustain uh, an exploitation of fish. Um, so those have now all been closed down. Okay. All of them uh, around Scotland. There's some small, very small half netting in the Solway Firth. Um, but uh, the main coastal netting stations have, have now all uh, closed down as part of this moratorium. We've also seen Scottish government uh, being more supportive of the boards and trusts on the ground to give um, either scientific, technical, or practical support on the ground. There's much more of a partnership going on there. And um, there's also been two reviews by members of the Scottish Parliament uh, into agriculture which we're just waiting for the outputs of. Um, but the first one came back and said that the um, you know, they needed to update the regulation about the agriculture industry. Okay, so, so, so it's kind of positive-ish. <laughs> but they are, the, the Scottish government obviously is only re, can be responsible for either things in the Scottish rivers or in the estuaries yeah. or in, you know, sea not too far off the coast. But as we've, we've, we've talked about earlier, the, when the salmon feed, when they go out to feed their feeding grounds, you know, on, we're away from that jurisdiction. So who, where, where's the jurisdiction for, for that? Who's responsible, if anybody, for issues that are happening at sea? Well, it's government. It's at a government level. Or at the moment for the UK, it's actually at an EU level. And um, uh, above the government, there's an international treaty called NASCO, which is the North Atlantic Salmon Conservation Organization, which is, is, is based uh, in Edinburgh. Uh, and it covers the whole of the Atlantic. Uh, and it's the only international treaty based in the UK. And they, they meet and they encourage governments and um, to set quotas, so they've just um, been negotiating uh, a reduction in the Greenland quota. They also have the ability to um, 
uh, bring together knowledge. So they get um, bring together the information around the different stocks of salmon in the North Atlantic to find out if um, they're at the levels they need to be, what's happening to them, what the main influences are on them. And they do that through asking questions of an organization called the International Council for the Exploration of the Seas, which is like big government departments to um, monitor efficiency uh, and bring in different aspects. So they'll be looking at temperatures, uh, currents and things like that. Sure. And if, if this current downturn in numbers continues, where do you see us being in, say, 20 years from now? If we do no, if we do nothing, yeah, we think that marine survival is going to continue to drop, and we will have fewer and fewer salmon coming back. At the moment, in Scotland, the return rate has dropped <laughs> from uh, above twenty five percent to between three and five percent, and we need to reverse that trend. We need to do it now. We need to start. You know, we, we haven't got the luxury of waiting ten, twenty, thirty years. No. Um, uh, and we need to reverse that trend and get marine survival improving. Now, the work that's been done on other species has shown that's possible. Uh, we just need to learn, learn those lessons and then bring the people together um, to, to make the change. Because salmon, from all accounts, they're quite a, um, they're quite a tough species, aren't they? I mean, they're quite resilient and they've adapted over millions of years to this system spawning to kind of protect them and and it would be i mean you have to work pretty hard to wipe them out but we seem to be we seem to be managing to, to do it <laughs> they seem to be doing a remarkably good job of yeah. it even though they are a very very resilient animal yeah. uh and that and their whole you know um strategy is to colonize new areas of course they're uh and you know to thrive um, but uh, somehow we do seem to be messing it up hugely, and we need to st- we need to stop doing that, and we need to reverse this trend. Yeah, I mean, you I- know, so what, what for us in the next five years, you know, we we want to see we we want to understand why we've got this decline going down. What are the relevant components of it? Do the likely suspects framework? When we've got that information, use that to affect change. This, this is not for um, uh, academic interest. This is to make a, a positive difference yeah. to the number of salmon coming back to the shores around the North Atlantic. Um, we've mentioned um, seals earlier eating salmon, and we've all seen the pictures of, um, although I think you mentioned earlier, different species probably, um, but, you know, out in Canada and Alaska with the sockeyes and um, the Pacific salmon, we've all seen the pictures of kind of bears feeding on them. So there's a whole ecosystem that relies on salmon. And I'm just curious, in the UK, I mean, we've mentioned seals, but what other parts of the ecosystem are kind of connected to Atlantic salmon, if any? Well, there's, there's, it's, it's one of these keystone species because they do... Adult salmon are quite rare because they go they go to sea as small fish as small smolts. Mm. They then go pick pick up all these nutrients at sea. You know they come back as big fish, and then they come up into these upland areas and spawn. And then the majority of them die, so mm. they're quite rare in that they bring nutrients from the sea back onto the land because most of the time the nutrients go from the land into the sea. Right. So they're really important for the. Um, the ecology and the well-being of these upland river areas. Um, and you've also got peculiar species such as the freshwater pearl mussel that depends on them. You know, the, the freshwater pearl mussel is it, it spawns in, in fresh water and it releases is the egg and sperm into the water into the river. Those egg and sperm have to meet and fertilise the egg. Um, that fertilised egg then has to land on the gill plate of a salmon. Sometimes a trout. <laughs> it then grows for a little bit on the salmon, and then it has to drop off over a spawning ground, uh, and then um, it will filter feed and help cleans up the water, um, and it will grow for 100, 150 years longer in Scandinavian countries. Um, these are incredibly rare animals. Yeah. And if we lose, if we lose the fish, we lose 
them, we lose the otters. Yeah. Um, we, yeah, it's, it's that whole environment is dependent upon salmon. And not only that, but it's like, it's an iconic species across yeah. the whole of the UK. And um, Especially for Scotland, we, though, I mean, it, it's like the red deer, really, isn't it? It's, it's got this yeah, iconic absolutely. image of, of Scotland, and it would be... It would be a travesty to see some some of those rivers um, no longer being considered a salmon river. But it's also used as um, as a big uh, yeah, as they as they've um, brought back the Mersey or the Thames in mm. terms of water quality, and we've had salmon colonised Mersey. Mm. Um, everyone's absolutely amazed that we've got salmon in the Mersey again because it used to be. You know, a pipe, <laughs> industrial cities, you know, industrial heartland of the north, and um, it wasn't the cleanest water in the world. And now that it's been cleaned up, the salmon have come back, and people are so proud of that fact. Yeah. I went back to Manchester recently, and people were showing me videos of um, salmon spawning at the top of the Mersey. And um, when I left there 25 years ago, that was unthinkable. Yeah. So there are some good news stories out there, but we need to make sure that we don't lose them but, but, um, from where we've got them. But there's good news stories, as you know, the ones you mentioned, I, and, I, and I've got one here. I mean, I, I live just on the edge of Sheffield, and we're now seeing salmon returning up the, the River Don um, as far as, I think, I think Rotherham, um, one of the weirs there, there was, there was spy yeah. trying to leap, which on the face of it seemed good news stories, but actually when you when you look at the history it's it's it's, it's not because these three or four hundred years ago these rivers were absolutely prolific and then we essentially just wiped out all life uh through pollutants so you know the yeah. good news stories are a few salmon starting to trickle back but um so which is good don't get me wrong but we've got a long way to go i think before we're anywhere near how things were before we started meddling Yes, and we can't be complacent, and we can't let apathy rule. Mm-hmm. You know, we we need to actively get involved and turn around this trend so that the salmon have a future. If we just sit back and watch or argue amongst ourselves, the salmon will be gone before we we wake up to that fact. So so we need to we need to intervene now. Okay. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about fishing, if possible. Um, yeah. So. There is a, a big move within salmon angling due to the declining stocks and just the way angling seems to be to, to move to catch and release fishing uh, for salmon. I'll talk about salmon because that's what we're, yeah. we're kind of, you know, we're talking about now. And obviously with declining salmon stocks, that's the right thing to do. Uh, we need every salmon possible to reach its spawning area. But I, I sometimes feel that it, it's patching up the symptoms of what's happened elsewhere and that really what anglers seem to be doing is, is shifting the responsibility from the things we've talked about, such as the fish farming or predation or, or all those other factors. They're shifting responsibility for the decline in numbers from that onto themselves. So it looks like that catch and release is required in order to save the salmon, when actually sometimes I think it's the other way around, is a catch and release is required because it's a symptom of what's already happened. Shouldn't there be, in an ideal world, a natural surplus of wild salmon that would allow recreational anglers to take a fish for the table? We're not talking many fish because we all know how hard they are to catch on a fly or spinning you know however you prefer to fish for them but shouldn't we be in that position where we have that yeah. natural surplus i think i think that's when you can say that we you know really reverse the trend yeah and um there's a there's an abundance of salmon that that's what we're all working towards um that's what we all want to see and um you know, catch and release is part of that solution yeah you know, we do need to make sure that as many survived the spawn. But it, it's also been helpful from a management point of view um, that goes beyond just ensuring that those fish that are put back survive. You know, I remember talking to the Scottish government um, a few years back and, and saying we're not getting enough fish to survive because there's, whilst 
the, the river I was on was catch and release, and it was a voluntary catch and release, and the anglers were putting over 99% of the fish back. There was there was a mixed stock fishery operating in the district to the south. Right. <laughs> that was intercepting fish. And we were able to use that as part of the process to get them to put this moratorium. We weren't the only reason, but there was, you know, it was part of the process of saying, we've got this, the anglers putting everything back. We've gone catch and release. 99% of the fish are going back. Yeah. We need, you know, yet we're still losing this portion of the stock from uh, netting industry. And there's not enough fish to go around at the moment. Um, and we need to reduce the number being killed. Yeah. And whilst we're doing that, there's also it also puts pressure on the management organisations to make sure the habitat's as good as possible, make sure all the obstacles to fish migration are removed. So you're looking at the bed and board of the fish as, as much as possible. Sure. Um, one thing we've not touched on that I'd, I'd like to just get a quick word on is is hatcheries uh, yeah. and stocking. And, and I've seen this out in um, British Columbia and... Mm-hmm. Uh, I think if I'm right, there's there's some restocking of rivers in Norway and in the UK as well. Um, could you just quickly kind of explain how that works and what the benefits of stocking are, or can it also cause have its own problems? How long have you got? <laughs> I'll try and um, you can take a, you can take as short or as long as you want. <laughs> I I think the um, it's not a cure all no. that will fix all that is wrong with salmon. However, hatchers have a have a role to play in helping get round problems whilst the underlying issues are fixed. There's, there's a really good example in Galloway okay. where with uh, um, uh, when we had acid rain and acidification of the waters, um, the eggs that were laid down by salmon in the wild were unable to hatch because the pH was too low, the water was too acidic at a, a key stage in their life cycle, and they couldn't hatch. It blocked an enzyme that allowed them to hatch. Right. So the likes of the Galloway Fisheries Trust took them into to eggs into a hatchery where they maintained the pH level, the acidity level, uh, a level where the eggs could hatch, and then restock them out. And it's just a clear example of, right, we've got a problem. This is a way round it uh, until we get it fixed. And, you know, they've been working hard to restructure the, the um, conifer plantations, uh, and there's been government curbs on um, uh, sulfur dioxide emissions to bring down acidification issues. So um, it, it's not, it doesn't cure everything, but it helps them get around that problem. Um, I think if you're going to stock, you need to know why you're going to stock, as in, you know, what, where's, what, what's the problem that you have? And um, will it actually fix it? Or is it just giving you a warm feeling? So are we, talk, can, are we talking here about, we're, we're talking about taking, taking, I think what is called a brood fish out of the river, fertilizing the eggs rearing them past that stage of high mortality until they get to a certain size par is that right and then we're introducing them into the headlands the streams that they would have normally spawned and is is that the process that we're looking at pretty much and people take it they either take the eggs out and return them as eggs or fry or par or smolts and um there's various thoughts i think um some of the research that's been done around indicates um, that if it's not done appropriately and for the right reasons, it can be incredibly damaging. Right. Um, an example is if you take some salmon off the reds, off the, off the spawning grounds, uh, and then put those those eggs you know, into a hatchery and you put male and female together, you don't know what relationship those fish are. They could be brother and sister. Mm. And if you make brother and sister, you are not going to get the best offspring in the world. Um, the fish have ways of working this out. They've been doing it brilliantly, <laughs> as you say, millions of years, mm. thousands and thousands of years. We've been doing it for about 140. Um, they're quite good at it. We're learning. Mm. Um, and whilst we're learning, we've probably made lots and lots of mistakes. 
Um, and we need to learn from those mistakes and, and only do it uh, when we're very sure of why we're doing it. Sure. Because it can cause damage. And um, uh, if it was the cure-all, I think people would have actually put it into practice by now. Yeah. Uh, and we'd, we would not be in the the state of fish stocks that we have at present if it were, if it all worked. Yeah. Um, but is, there is a role for it. Uh, in in certain quarters, I I try and make it up to Scotland as often as I can. Um, yep. Some trips more successful than others, <laughs> but that's salmon fishing. However, yeah. this year particularly, speaking to the anglers in some of the bars and hotels, there was a more despondent tone than. I've recognised before a little bit more than you know that's just fishing um, yeah if we see this continued decline in, in salmon stocks do you have any idea of the impact for these regions that rely on recreational salmon angling in terms of tourism are there any figures to put on that oh, that's put me on the spot um, yeah uh, <laughs> salmon fishing it's a major component uh of the scottish rural economy yeah um so when you get away from the main towns and cities you know fishing is important mm. uh, from memory i think it generates over 130 million um throughout the local economy and it's in excess of 2,000 jobs that it supports uh, and these are jobs in the rural economy um well, there's the knock-on as well because i know where where i stay normally the, the little hotel that I stay in, the lady there says that from when the salmon season opens, which I think is around the end of January there or beginning of February, through those late winter and early spring months, it's essentially anglers that keep her business going until the, the sunshine comes out and the warm weather and uh, she gets the tourist. I couldn't agree more. It's the difference because um, it's not just the fishing beat where the money goes, actually. Only a small percentage goes to the fishing beat or the ghillie. So when there's no fish, it is the wider economy that suffers. It is the hotels, the pubs, the petrol stations. And quite often, as you just pointed out, the the fishing industry, salmon industry, salmon, it's the difference between those hotels and pubs surviving or not surviving. Mm. Um when I was working on a review, you'd see at the start of the season, you'd start to see all of the rod racks appearing on the cars outside yeah. of the hotels. And it was the first time that had been light on in the hotel for a little while. So, you know, it's good to see. Yeah. Um, a little bit of a different question this time. Um, last year, it came to prominence. I think, I think they've been arriving for a while, but it came to prominence, especially on uh, if you follow some of the social media accounts of the gillies and the fisheries about the pacific salmon that were starting yep. to run and by all accounts successfully spawn in some of the rivers and th there seemed to be a lot of mixed opinion about what's happening so uh, i believe the official kind of line is these fish must be removed and culled well, and the, the from an angler's point of view, again, th th there's a big divide. Some are, uh, are saying, look, you know, what will be will be. You know, if these fish start running and spawning, it's nature. and We have to, you know, to let it happen. And the other side of the coin is anglers saying, no, we don't want them. You know, this is going to interfere with Atlantic salmon or the fisheries and they should be culled. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that at all. Yeah, um, I, I, was, I was involved in the management of River that had pink salmon on it last year. Okay. And, uh, is that the same as a Pacific salmon, a pink salmon? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it, the, pink, the same um, name. There's several species of um, salmon in the Pacific, and they're all grouped together as Pacific salmon. Okay. But um, the pinks uh, or humpbacks or humpies are the ones that we had um, coming last year to Scotland, well, the whole of the UK last year. And we also had fishing beats on the river saying, um, uh, what do you want us to do? Because there was very little information. It started off as it was just one or two, and um, when it's when we when they were first noticed, um, people said, "Well, it's something extra to fish for." The, the gillies were saying it's something extra to fish for. Yeah, and then they turned up on their beats, and the first thing they did was ask us to remove them. 
and to kill them. Mm. They didn't want them there. They didn't think it would add to the fishing. Whereas these pinks are lovely fish when they're in the sea, and that's where you get your canned pink salmon from. That's know, right. Yes. Supermarket. Um, uh, when they, by the time they've been in fresh water for a, a week or so, um, they're pretty ropey looking things. They don't provide any sport for anybody, and they are thought to be quite damaging to Atlantic salmon. They're just trying to work out. A, how invasive they're going to be, and B, what damage they could cause. Um, but I think you need to look at, in, in the absence of these hard facts, you need to look at common sense. Mm. You look at what happened to red squirrels when the grey squirrels came along. Yeah. You know, they, they were displaced. But there's also disease issues that were brought along with the greys, you know, the squirrel pox. So it, the, you have to take a, pre, a precautionary approach with these. And... Um, uh, I, I don't think the presence of pinks is going to do Atlantic salmon any good whatsoever. No. The Missing Salmon Project, just to recap, how can anglers or how can the public, how can they help? Can they donate? Can they publicise it? What can they do to, to help you on your mission to restore Atlantic salmon stocks? First and foremost, um, they can have a look on either. Uh, we have a missing salmon um, uh, Facebook and website page uh, because although it's the Atlantic Salmon Trust that is sort of trying to get this off the ground, we're trying to do this in collaboration with uh, other organisations. We think it's going to take a really concerted effort to to get movement on this. So we've got about thirty five organisations supporting us. Uh, and it's there on our, our Missing Salmon Project webpage and Facebook. And um, we've also got a crowdfunder on that. So if people want to make a donation, whether it's five pounds, five hundred, or whatever, um, it, it, all of it is going towards um, the Missing Salmon Project. None of it's going into running the Atlantic Salmon Trust. Okay. Um, it is all going. Um, to looking after salmon and trying to reverse this trend. So again, please have a look on our website. But if any of your listeners find themselves up at the Scottish Game Fair, which starts on June 30th, and carries on over the weekend to July the 1st, we've got a stand on Fisherman's Row. Um, come and question us. Come and talk to us. Come and listen to us. Um, come and see how you can help face to face. And we should also be at other game fairs uh, around the country. Please get involved because the more people that are involved in trying to reverse this trend, the greater the likelihood of it happening. Well, best of luck, Mark, in in this project, and I hope I hope it does start revealing some of the answers to why we're seeing this decline in Atlantic salmon. Thank you so much for talking to us today. You're very welcome.